I'm just going to tell them to go back and try it again. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hope you can hear us. Coming to you live. Hopefully that's working now. Yeah, you're working. Okay, I'll let you go. Welcome. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Growers Short Course. This is uh, really fun for us. Um, and we're really excited to bring this program to you today. So sorry for the delay. We had a, a couple little glitches with some of our audio and um, hopefully it, it's going to work out for us. Sometimes the, the applications don't get picked up. So I'm Jen Llewellyn. I'm the Omafra Nursery and Landscape Specialist. And uh, I'm just looking at the chat group here. I see lots of good mornings. Um, <clears throat> so I'm your nursery growers. Uh, short course chair and program chair and I put this event together with a huge huge help with Landscape Ontario and particularly Amy Buchanan who most of you um, know very well and so welcome I hope that you're getting in and you can hear this okay and if you want to send me a chat saying we can hear you loud and clear Jen that would make me feel pretty good <laughs> because I can't see you in this platform so our platinum partner this year is Plant Products, and we thank Plant Products for a generous financial contribution to our short course. It helps to keep the registration costs down for attendees and uh, really helps to support these types of educational events. Awesome. And we also want to thank our new product showcase exhibitors, and they are AMA Horticulture, Growbark, a Walker Environmental Company, ICL Specialty Fertilizer, Specialty Products, and CAMS Grower Supplies. So thank you so much. We're gonna be hearing from our Platinum Partner and from our new product showcase um, exhibitors. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from them just before lunch. So you can definitely check that out. Oh, what do I need? I need a different mouse. I'm running off a couple of different laptops here today. And so speaking of lunch, uh, you have my deepest apologies because <clears throat> I know many of you were looking forward to the chicken fajitas at Royal Botanical Gardens. And I know I was, uh, so that's obviously not happening today, but it's certainly one of the, one of the highlights of the grower short course is that beautiful hot lunch. So here's how the day is gonna go. So you can see that there's a chat function on the right-hand side, so you can type in comments, or questions um, as we go along. And there's gonna be a question and answer period at the end of every section or every session room, okay? And there's four session rooms today. And so for each session room, one, two, three, four, you have to log out, close this program, and then log back in to the next session at that time. So you can look at the agenda online there on the LO website and see you need to be logging in a few minutes before the next session starts. We do have um, a lunch break, but otherwise we don't really have too many breaks. And it's not a full day compared to the short course. It's about four and a half hours of speaking compared to our usual like eight. Um, and for those of you that are certified arborists and you're looking for CEU credits, you can get CEU credits towards that designation and you can contact Amy uh, for, for the sheet to, to be able to fill out and send that in for some credits. We did get some credits for, for today's presentations. So we have a very diverse group of speakers at the short course this year. Um, and our speakers, many of them have a long history of research and service and horticulture and we're so glad that they made the time to be able to talk to us today. So speakers, don't forget that there's a question and answer period at the end of your session. So please stay on the webinar and you obviously can, can uh, go off video. Um, and if you are showing any videos, remember to turn your audio off or we'll get kind of an echo towards that. So without further ado, um, I'm your first speaker today. And as you know, I'm the nursery and landscape specialist with OMAFRA. I've been working in the nursery and landscape sector since 1998. And much of my role involves troubleshooting, 
crop production issues with many of you. And so I'm just going to say, what have we got 909? So <laughs> the, every year brings its challenges. Uh, but 2020 was, was pretty crazy. It was pretty unique. Um, that was probably the most memorable spring that, that, you know, I think that most of us are going to remember. Um, I can't fix the sun right now because I can't reach. I've got this beautiful morning sun coming in, um, fortunately on my face. Um, let me see if I can do this. One of the things I got for an after Christmas present was, uh, a standing desk that was motorized from my husband, my lovely husband. So um, I get to use that, it's fantastic. And with COVID-19 and everything that hit, you know, when we first started out in the spring, everything was hit. It wasn't exactly clear whether nursery producers were deemed essential and they almost were undesignated for quite a while. And it was really, really scary at the beginning. Um, and I have to say, you know, when times are tough, you really do find out who your friends are. And, you know, I, with us in the sector, so greenhouse floriculture crops, nursery crops, we all sort of banded together and we were putting up information on a daily basis to say, this is this is the sector, this sector needs to be essential, here's all the reasons why. I was polling a lot of you, asking you tons of questions, getting you to give me stats and figures. We fed them all up. And really, I have to thank my manager, Holly Dolan, who throughout the whole spring crazy COVID-19 process was right there supporting you. And, and many of you wouldn't know that because you don't get to see all the people that are behind me, but there are so many. I'm so grateful for our greenhouse and nursery team. I'm very grateful for my manager and upper management because together we all worked so hard to make sure that nursery production and eventually the rest of the value chain was deemed essential. And a lot of that, of course, was not just us. It was Landscape Ontario. Huge, huge efforts. Um, and also the Garden Writers Group, which some of you maybe didn't know. It was incredible. The, the stuff that was going on behind the scenes to make sure that this industry could open up. And it was very successful. It was very scary. There was uh, sometimes there, we weren't quite sure what to do. So one of the things I started doing was a COVID-19 connector call, a, a weekly call where everybody jumped on just to sort of talk about the problems, what was going on. Uh, and then the amount of problem solving and resources that were, that were uh, networked and, and, the information that was shared and just the fact that people could see that they weren't alone and um, they were able to solve so many problems so much faster. So it was an incredible experience. I must say that I was, I was very heartened to hear your voices every week. Um, we just made it a simple phone call because I know everybody was multitasking. Um, but I just want to thank you all so very much. I have a little video that I wanted to show you, but right now it's not showing up on my screen. So I'm going to have to show it a little bit later on in the day when I figure out how to do that. And then I just wanted to share a really short presentation just for some of the things that, that I've been working on this year. All right. And with every event, you know, we, we, we started off with this wonderful handshake saying, I'm so glad that you're here with us. And I know some of you are maybe in a, a small group, maybe in your cohort or your bubble, uh, your work bubble, your family bubble. But if you just take a second and turn to the person beside you and say, I'm so glad you're here with us and the other person can say thank you. And I must say, I am so glad that you're here with us today. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you like this. So I look forward to when we can start handshaking in person again with that full palm to palm contact that we always sort of joke about. So I've relied a lot on electronic communication, digital communication. And so my website, there's there's lots of information there, um, not just about nursery production issues, but a lot of funding programs that are available to us all right 
right now. Um, so do check that out. We've got a deadline coming up soon for some of the the worker safety funding, and uh, you know, hopefully there'll be some more programs in the future. We usually announce it on the website, and then I also have a grower email distribution group that I email you guys directly as soon as I hear something, whether you know. Um, it's from like a, an article that came out, a news release, la la la. So if you're not getting regular updates from me, <clears throat> send me your email address and I'll make sure that you're on my grower distribution list, okay? You're not bugging me. I'm also on Instagram. And so, yeah, this is the platform we've been relying on. This is a family Zoom call that we had for my father-in-law's 85th birthday last year um, but I'm going to be relying on this a little bit more in the future and one of the things that I wanted to do uh, was to have weekly updates for the industry so short zoom calls where I, I'm showing you pictures of videos of, of what's going on um, crop health issues stuff like that on a weekly basis <clears throat> at least in May and June and then we can go into bi-weekly as we go throughout the summer. You can jump on, you can watch the recording, you can ask questions, you can submit pictures, <clears throat> whatever you like, it's, it's totally up to you. But I think that I just want to do an even more uh, better job at some of these electronic regular communications. And this will be more about plant health, crop health type issues. That was a hilarious Zoom call, by the way. We were, we were laughing our guts out. So what has taken a lot of time uh, in 2020 for me behind the scenes too was editing our Crop Protection Guide for Nursery and Landscape Plants. You guys know it as Publication 840. There's the new edition. <clears throat> and I have to thank Winklemola Nursery and Cobes Nurseries for providing cover beautiful cover photos. Thank you so much. So this book has been actually improved. Um, there's and a lot of updates like the pesticides classification update that you'll see in chapter two there, how provincial classifications are now matching federal classifications and where that leaves you. You'll see that information right in there. Um, so your commercial products are now class C, for instance. And then we've added more tables, more reference tables. So you can find your crop protection products organized by product name. So here's the insecticides organized by product name. And then you can also find them organized by active ingredient, which is nice to be able to cross reference because sometimes you're looking for a product based on the AI, which is also very helpful. And then something else that we've created are these pesticide mode of action um, tables. So we've got them for insecticides, fungicides, acaricides, molluscicides, rodenticides. So you can look up basically what, what products are in what groups, and it's gonna help you with resistance management decisions. And uh, a lot of the schematics that you can see there were hand-drawn by my field technician, Kate, last year. So a uh, huge effort there in putting some of these resources for you. Um, and this book, the PDF version, Amy emailed it out to you, I believe yesterday morning. So we are able to sneak uh, a preview short course, nursery short course edition so that you would have this this guide. And then the other part I did was I added those pesticide mode of action groups right to the pest tables. So again, it's all there for you to make those, you know, pesticide resistance management the decisions a lot more easily. So I think you'll appreciate that. And of course, the, the rest of the book was updated. There's lots of updated information on application technology too. And just in case you didn't know, um, OMAFRA is moving to a digital content media platform for crop protection information and uh, hoping to get out a version of this next year, actually. So this is something that our crop protection guides will be turning into a, a digital system. So we'll be sharing more information with you on that in the future. So lots of projects were still able to happen this year. This is Janine and her daughter, Hannah. I saw a lot of researchers hire their kids this year, which was really, really sweet because um, they were cohorting together anyway. Most most kids move back home uh, for the summer when they're going to university. So Janine was was able to still go on with the pond study and I'm a, a, a a minor member of that group. They do the vast majority of the work, but uh, I'm involved in a lot of different projects. And, and you'll see that from the speakers today. Um, we did continue on with our Oakville, Oakville vector 
um, survey for the nitidulid beetles as vectors of oak wilt uh, to better understand and make better management decisions. And this is Hannah Frazier, our provincial entomologist. She's absolutely fantastic and totally stepped in um, when we weren't sure how much we could travel for COVID. And she ended up doing the vast majority of the trap collection. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you to Hannah. And then we've got Abby Wiesner. She is the master's student with the University of Guelph and she is working on box tree moth. You're gonna hear from her today. So we were able to work um, despite, you know, the COVID we, with um, public health regulations and, and safety and, and all those types of things and sanitation, we're able to keep going along so there's a box tree moth larva. And I just wanted to say quickly, um, if you aren't already, it's probably in your best interest to order some traps. So these are the carton style traps that we use. They're solita.ca is the, the business. They're in Quebec and that's where we ordered them from. The pheromones are attracted for about a seven meter radius around each pheromone. And you can buy the trap, the pheromone, the sticky liner. It's about $22 for each one. Um, and then you'll need to get a, a top up pheromone depending on, on which ones you actually buy. But if you, if you do want help with that, it can certainly give you some more information. But I would encourage you to be trapping for box tree moth outside of your boxwood production zones for your own information to be able to say that this pest is, is not present. And uh, a big thank you to our nursery scout program and our OMAFR field technicians. We had Kate and Mitchell this year, and many of you knew them because they were scouting at your nursery on a regular basis. And check your emails because I will be putting out an email for the lottery uh, for the 2021 scout. If you're interested, the email is gonna say something like, do you want a, a nursery scout in 2021? And uh, whoever answers me back first gets on the program. And I also just really quickly wanted to say to be looking out for spotted lantern fly. And we're going to be talking about these issues um, in my upcoming, I don't know why that jumped out. In the upcoming, <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip over that. Here we go, nursery grower IPM preseason seminars that are coming up next week on Tuesday morning. So it'll be a full morning event. And check your inbox, your email or a calendar invite for Tuesday, February 23rd, and you can actually register for that event. And we're gonna be covering a lot of issues in, in a lot more detail than, than I obviously can here today. So with that, I'm going to stop talking about me and introduce our first guest speaker. So, all right, we've got Dusty coming up and he'll be turning his video back on. So Dusty Zemenchik is the owner of Easy Grow Farms, which is um, a blueberry production and international strawberry plant propagation business. Uh, co-owner of Hometown Brew in Norfolk County, uh, which is a microbrewery, and they have products available in three provinces across all sales channels. He's currently the Blueberry Director for the Berry Growers of Ontario. He's Chair of the Norfolk County Agricultural Advisory Council. He's a Canadian Hort Council Berry Working Group member. He says that the Buffalo Bills and a cold draft beer bring him utmost happiness. And he is in good company today. So welcome, Dusty. And when you do turn on your screen share, if you just share the application for your, your PowerPoint, it'll work. It'll work much better. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear me, Jennifer? Okay. Um, just want to say thank you for the introduction and good morning. Um, I'm going to ask for the same uh, for the same question. If someone could just in the uh, chat box say yes, I can hear you, Dusty. If I can just get someone say yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, coming to you live here from the uh, southwest corner of Norfolk County, a few uh, kilometers just off the lake here on uh, of Lake Erie. Um, and uh, very excited to be here. Like I said, uh, I've been called uh, a lot worse, um, but my my last name is is Zamanek. 
Um, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've been called many, many things, but, uh, but yeah, happy to, happy to be here. I'm going to bring on my presentation right now. Um, uh, cause I want to show, uh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Okay. So like it's, and like how Jennifer nicely, um, explained uh here at easy grow farms we uh we, we grow 33 acres of high bush blueberries we've been uh my father and grandfather and family have been doing blueberries uh since the late 60s um and uh that's been and that's sort of been the the staple product um of our farm and operation for for quite some time tobacco has made uh was part of our family for for quite some time as well um uh, you name it watermelons cantaloupes rose bushes raspberries potatoes you name it uh and strawberry nursery and we're here to talk about beer and i was asked to talk about beer and what we did um to uh, to adapt to COVID nineteen uh, in in the in the beer world, um, but uh, we're also a strawberry plant nursery uh, for customers across the eastern seaboard, southern U S, and for the greenhouse industry. Um, I was like this. Um, this was I, I moved back to farm and in a quick synopsis, I um, I left uh, Norfolk County, graduating high school. I went to Nova Scotia and I moved uh, to Anniganish. Uh, home of St. Francis Xavier University, I received my degree in economics. And uh, at that point, my, my, my ambition was to not be an astronaut or a dentist or, or a farmer, um, but uh, it was actually to be a fruit buyer for, for Loblaws. That's all I wanted to do was I wanted to buy fruit and vegetables. Um, and when that, uh, when that dream fell flat, uh, my second passion uh, beyond that was to, uh, was beer. And uh, I, I loved beer um, and everything about it, not only the consumption of it, but the marketing, where the gaps are, uh, just the, the whole the whole premise was uh, was always fascinating. And the opportunity to work uh, at Labatt uh, in, a, in a very integrated and innovative role was, uh, was, was an opportunity I, I ran at. But I missed the farm. And it was always something that uh, my parents were forced to come back to the farm. But, and they said, no, Dusty, we want you to have the opportunity to make the decision on your own. And um, I was finding myself not furthering my career at Labatt, but in October when we were digging plants uh, for, our, for our customers, um, I found myself back on the farm and working in the fields on weekends. And, uh, and that's when I knew the writing was on the wall to return. Um, so here I am my first year trying to do some value add for the farm and uh, just if you're not embarrassed um, you're not uh, you probably launched too late um, and now we are here at easy grow uh, proud to innovate into uh, in, into to working with the greenhouse industry as well as our customers abroad to develop a strawberry plant that is both on time is both greenhouse and uh, commercial plant ready um, to uh, to take uh, domestic strawberry production to the winter time to the next level. So as you can see here, we're 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 getting those berries bred, and we're, we're very proud. But we're here to talk about beer. <clears throat> when I returned back to the farm, I um, I was I was interested in starting up, uh, uh, you know, adding more to the farm. But also, I was swirling around this knowledge of of where what where the gaps were in the craft beer industry, and how I alluded to, we grew twenty acres of high bush blueberries. Um, uh, of course, well, why not? Let's start with the blueberry beer, and it all started with uh, with, with sheer luck uh, in a Halifax bar, and uh, and and a conversation. And that conversation in Halifax would lead to uh, almost three years later, um, the, uh, the introduction of our first beer, Blueberry Saison. Um, in those three years, uh, quickly we found as we were doing marketing that, um, that men were afraid. I'm not calling men out, don't get me wrong, but what I am saying is that men were afraid of holding this. So instead, <clears throat> they would give, their, give the Blueberry Saison to their wife, uh, or to the partner and uh, here honey you drink the blueberry beer 
then when they would cross back, it would uh, <laughs> it would say, uh, well, wow, actually, I might keep that. So we, we knew we were brewing the beer correctly, but what was happening was we were marketing it poorly. Uh, so we put it into a can, gave it a trade name, and uh, Blue County, and off the races we go. Um, beyond that, we do we developed Southern Ale, which is a Alexander Keith's meets Molson Canadian. Um, Southern Light, which is uh, in a 355 mil format, just a light lager. We teamed up with the NHL when they came to Tilsonburg uh, during the centennial year of the NHL. And our organic wild wheat featuring 100% organic malt and hops from 100% Canadian producers. And of course, bar sales. Um, little did we know when we uh, that we were we were creating waves, and we were um, at a fun at a fun time in Norfolk County as uh, Norfolk County was uh, was developing its marketing and, and changing. Uh, it's you know it's it's adapting from an innovative agricultural area to also a, a an emerging uh, stay and play area. And we uh, we teamed up with Long Point Eco Adventures on the shores of Lake Erie and uh, uh, right above the Turkey Point Long Point Basin on Front Road. Um, we developed a simple sea can outdoor p uh, patio um, tap room, which leading up to COVID was always seen as a hindrance. Little did we know that a completely outdoor patio would end up being uh, almost like a a blessing in disguise with the ability to spread uh, people's ability to enjoy beer and uh, the passion that people were looking for to get out, uh, even if it was for a day trip. Um, there's a stat that says that uh, a day trip for people from the GTA or from large or, uh, urban centers is considered uh, two less than two hours in one direction. So people are willing to drive four hours in one day round trip uh, and fit in experiences in between and consider, consider that a day trip. And Norf Norfolk County is uh, an hour 45. Uh, so we really promoted and pushed on uh, on that accessibility as legally as we could. So what did we do in, in 12 months uh, to, to take this opportunity uh, that we had um, and uh, to really hunker down? Sales channels were changing. Um, what were we doing to uh, uh, to continue staying on the map? So we just brewed as many things as possible to stay relevant, to stay in the game, and to uh, in small batches uh, to give people experiences uh, and further developing this online marketplace that was already existed. Um, but uh, how do we do door to door? How do we get more beer in people's hands? Because yes, consumption may have slowed down somewhat because you're not going to your traditional bars and restaurants, but on, on weekends, people's activities uh, were just moving locations, but the activity we, we found was not changing. And that activity is of course, drinking alcohol. Um, so we, uh, it took us three and a half years to develop five core brands. And in 12 months, we, we developed Coconut County, Hazy Susan, which are now, uh, one of our biggest sellers in the LCBO and further developing our, uh, our Pilsner market, which is in coordination with the Turkey Point Mountain Club. Um, it's remarkable Turkey Point not having a single mountain has uh, is now over a hundred kilometers of mountain biking trails uh, that range from beginner all the way up to psychos. Um, and uh, I, I fall somewhere in the middle of it. And, uh, and it's, it, it's pretty remarkable the activities that are in our backyard. And, uh, and we wanted to pair some beers along with that. Um, our blueberry beer, uh, which is going to lead into one of our, which one of our, I, th I think one of our most proudest mo uh, programs that we did in COVID. Um, our, our blueberry beer is 100% um, uh, has 100% blueberries coming from our fields. Um, we didn't know how to get the bloody blueberries in the beer. Uh, we know we didn't want to use uh, synthetic blueberries. Um, and we didn't know how to get a clean product into the beer when we first started. And uh, a quick synopsis is that this was one of our biggest failures that turned one of our biggest successes. Um, we, were doing, we were doing a great press and trying to uh, effectively 
press and press and press um, the uh, the juice out of it, but all we were getting was a seedy, fibrous mix. Well, what we looked back is, as you can see, that we have our bagged of about 25 to 30 pound bagged blueberries, which are our number twos that come off of our grading line for the plant, for the berries that don't make it to national grocers. Um, they, uh, they started juicing themselves as they were thawing. And what we were getting was this completely filtered by the skin blueberry juice that looked like complete motor oil, but it was pure, it was clean, it was vastly inefficient, um, but it uh, but it was a superior product, and um, and this pure uh, natural sugar um, blueberry was uh, was what we ended up putting into Blue County, and uh, we started out like I alluded to in the top left with a blueberry saison bottle, um, and then uh, eventually moving it into a four seventy three mil format for multiple reasons. And, uh, and and it was a blessing in disguise uh, as well for COVID as people um, were obviously, uh, and people were buying different products and I'll, I'll buy one or two of this and one or two of that as well, um, uh, assessing the urban population, how a lot of people do not have cars in, in lieu of bicycles and backpacks and bottles and jingling around does not tend to uh, fare well together. And now that's why all of our formats are now in a 473. Which led us to um, our Blueberry Saison hand sanitizer. Um, I, uh, I unfortunately can't, can't share too many photos uh, of this right now, uh, unfortunately, because um, we, we actually received a cease and desist letter from the government of Canada um, because, uh, I mean, here is a, a couple guys down in Norfolk County effectively making moonshine. And that really popped up on the radar that they were worried that we were doing, that we were, uh, whiskey runners down here on the South of 45. But what we, what we did have is a lot of blueberry and a lot of beer, especially our blueberry beer that has a very low shelf life. Um, and it's all, not, it's not, of course, every business and it's not all roses and, and whatnot, um, is that uh, we did, unfortunately, have to uh, dispel and, and, and pour out a lot of beer. But as we were doing that, we were, we were figuring, well, we have this, this the Saison beer, which is naturally sugar um, and, and high alcohol. And we have uh, an additive with uh, blueberries that, uh, that is high in natural sugars. Why can't we still that down? And, uh, and see how, how pure can we get all of this beer? So our, 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 our brewer, Maddie, um, took kegs and kegs and cans, and I mean hundreds of liters, and stilled it down. And uh, we were able to take, um, as a screw around project uh, in the April um, 2020, uh, and turn it into a, uh, a both a marketing success, a community rallying point, uh, an opportunity to get hand sanitizer into um, the very uh, you know people at that time the elderly uh, in, in long term care homes uh, and whatnot, and, and also a massive fundraiser for the Holdman Norfolk um, Senior Services. And uh, it was a simple thing um, because, uh, of course, remember the cease and desist letter. Uh, we could not profit off of this because we did not have a manufacturer license. Uh, we were pretty much, um, yeah, the Dukes of Hazard down here in, in Langton. And, um, but it was all put in, mixed with aloe and into, into one or two ounce bottles. And with your, with your purchase of beer, you can make a donation to the Haldeman uh, Norfolk Senior Services Center. And um, that does meals to go and in home or uh, call visits, etc. And uh, it turned into a, a massive fundraising success. Um, it's something that we're all very proud of uh, until we were forced to stop. Um, so we don't we, we don't make it anymore. Um, but if anybody wants to make some moonshine, uh, may or may not, you can uh, get in touch with uh, with us and. We, we, we can we can chat with you uh, anyways but, but moving on um, uh, it was uh, it, it was very fun to uh, to learn the process to, uh, to to see what was capable and to uh, not sit in our laurels 
and see what can we do for our community because our community has supported us uh, this thus far, and uh, and, and we're very we're, we're we're pleased. Another thing we did was our was our outdoor sea can, as you can see, a very simple sea can. Um, the AGCO um, at that time they were all all the liquor board was concerned with was how can we. Um, you know, support small business, but also reduce the amount of, uh, you know, uh, open up capacity loads. So we, we took this simple sea can and uh, we were actually licensed for almost quadruple the size, but we didn't add any more occupancy uh, just so we could spread people out, just simple things like that. Um, and in uh, the addition of, uh, of an outdoor restaurant on the, um, on the Lake Erie shore, um that is uh that is outdoor able to be very airy of course when it rains um uh, not not so good um uh, but uh that's the that's the risk they were willing to take uh to uh, to take in the view uh and to have uh, a sense of normalcy for both our customers and our community uh and what jennifer alluded to um is we're, we're very proud as well to have our products now offered both in St. John's and, uh, and across Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, and now successfully in, uh, in the NSLC and some private liquor stores um, and soon to be bars uh, in, the, in the great province of, of Nova Scotia that, uh, that I can't wait to fly out there um to uh to, to crack one of my one of our beers but uh it, it wasn't just uh hey you know it, our, our company is large enough let's start selling out there um really taking advantage of how people are drinking where are avenues for for products to to move volume of beer um selling cans is a very is an expensive way of moving beer at the single it's a single use can obviously from our perspective um uh, as opposed to, of course, draft, etc. But uh, all in all, um, it was uh, it was an avenue that we've been considering for quite some time. But uh, COVID gave us the opportunity to harness and see the potentials of uh, of where the different spots across Canada that um, that are missing gaps, or whether whether gaps are for our style of products, whether it be the blueberry, whether it be the coconut or whether it be a tall can in general. Nova Scotia is still very based on uh, on, on large bottle formats. Um, uh, it, in the grand scheme of things, the whole uh, country of Canada is about, um, I'd say five to 10 years behind uh, US and craft beer trends. Uh, British Columbia would be about five years behind, um, would be our, probably our most advanced child. Um, and then uh, Ontario and Quebec, are, are, are really up there um, being behind BC in flavor profiles and just ability for brew. And then um, and Nova Scotia, just in, uh, just in itself with how they're marketing and their, and their packaging trends, um, there's opportunities that we saw to get our brands into Nova Scotia. And, um, and so far it's working. And, uh, and, and lastly, this was uh, our relative, uh, our, our fourth year birthday party, uh, myself, with the uh, with the funny hat on, um, I don't know why. I just, just I wanted to go. Um, uh, I just wanted to dress up for a day. Um, and then Maddie, our brewer in the Cleveland Browns number sixty seven Austin Pastor jersey, and uh, and Tommy on the with the blue uh, with the blue neck um, with the orange necktie, and uh, he's uh, our, our in house man. And um, it's uh, it's it's been a fun team. So, uh, so yeah, so that's that's our, our all in all for here from hometown and for Easy Grow. I, I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and uh, it's been a blast. It, it's hilarious fitting all of those experiences in, of course, in uh, in, in twenty minutes. Um, and <laughs> I'm sure we can uh, we can go on and on uh, from the from the, the the nursery side and the plant side uh, with labor and of course offshore offshore workers and getting essential and etc but that's for another day so i appreciate your time and uh i look forward to you at 10 o'clock welcome chats then great thank you dusty it's it's amazing you really find out what people are made of when uh, we get into these these crazy situations so our next speaker is janine 
Janine West. She operates PhytoServe, a horticultural consulting company. Many of you know Janine. She supports growers with regulatory issues and collaborates with researchers and government agencies to help develop sustainable water, nutrient, and pest management solutions for greenhouse and nursery crops. Janine also represents the nursery industry as a grower technical analyst for Landscape Ontario. So she is your provincial grower rep. Please welcome Janine. Thank you, Jen. Okay, so we were having some technical issues earlier. So I really need some feedback on the audio. Can you hear me? Okay, send I yes. I hear you really well. Home. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, yeah. so let's see if this works this time. That was a big hiccup before the presentation. So, all right. Amy got me through it. That's wonderful. Thanks for the yeses in the chat. Okay, so um, now I don't know how this works exactly. We'll see if I can make this happen. Um, if uh, we'll see how this works, let me let me know if uh, send me a text, Jen, if anything goes wrong here. If you can see my screen, okay. Um, so safety and efficiency, getting an upgrade. It's not uh, this like going to be the focus of today, but I just want to um, mention some of the other things that I am working on for you. So as Jen said, I'm. I'm your safety, uh, your your nursery rep, and I'm getting my fingers into a lot of different things. Um, can you see that, that, Jen? Can you just send me a text that says yes, if you can see my next slide there? It all looks good. Okay, perfect, thank you. So uh, I'm getting, uh, expanding uh, the things that I talk about uh, a little bit this year. We got a new project on the plate, but I'm still doing some of the other things. So invasive species, um, still uh, I'm back on that file. Uh, water, as always, you know that I get involved with environmental type issues. And uh, so we'll touch base on that. Uh, Jen's project and, and work and CNLA's work on uh, box tree moth, I'm involved with that. And we have a new project that I'll spend the bulk of the time on. And Dusty was saying how, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity to chat maybe today about labor and migrant workers, et cetera, but I'll, I will touch base on that. So that was a good segue. So we have a new project. Um, it's, we're nicknaming it Lola because the name of it was so long and so complicated. So we had to come up with something short. And so Landscape Ontario Labor Assessment is what we're briefing it as, but it's OMAFRA has been watching what's been happening with our sector for the last year and how difficult it's been. The challenges that we've had with getting our, our staff when we need them, what happens when we have a COVID outbreak on the farm and we are short people from a certain team or maybe a whole, a whole household of workers, whether they be uh, temporary foreign workers or local staff that are just part of our small families uh, of worker, working teams. And um, so there's, they've been seeing what's been going on, recognizing that COVID had such a huge impact on our on how we did things and how it changed things. And we ended up having a good year, but certainly not without stress. I've talked to so many of you now and and we know that you had so many challenges dealing with, with staff issues and, and managing getting the work done and some work just didn't get done last year. And we're going into another year of this. Some certainties, uh, some knowns that are better than last year and some things that are maybe more challenging than last year, uh, as we have more complications with variants, et cetera, and, and higher case numbers. So just before Christmas, uh, OMAFRA reached out to actually all of the farm uh, growing associations in, in Ontario, all the commodity groups and said, look, we know you're having issues. Could we talk about getting some, could we share some funds with you so you could come up with a plan? We need to know what your sector needs. And we jumped at that opportunity. We said, absolutely, if there's something that we could do to work with you as our members and understand what you need and develop some kind of strategy going forward, wouldn't that be amazing to just if there's some way we can help? So we put in an application. We got it in on the first day of back to work in January. Uh, we presented that to some of you uh, that were on calls. And so we're sharing that now that we officially have a funding program in place that OMAFRA is, is covering. And uh, we have a, 
phenomenal team. I mean, most of you know Anne, a lot of you will know Christoph. Uh, everybody knows Jen here. And we brought in uh, Berman Communications from Ottawa. They are gonna look after um, a big portion of the work and we'll get into that in a bit more detail. So we basically have six weeks left in the project. It's a really short time frame. We have said, they said, do this and do it quick. Um, so we, we said, okay, what, let, what, can we what can we bite off here? So um, what we wanted to do is identify primarily uh, from a, an employer perspective, where are those labor vulnerabilities and um, identify what it is that you need to move uh, to the next level or to think about what potential, uh, sorry, I got something in my eye naturally. Um, so what, what areas of your farm could you use help with? What are your areas of your farm and activities did you find huge risks with, with staffing um, when you had a COVID outbreak? So we're looking at it through the lens of when COVID is happening, but it's really fundamentally about labor and, and something else could happen in the future that could impact our ability to access our labor force. So we should be thinking about how to mitigate that. Um, because it's through the lens of COVID, we need to look at, at COVID risks, but we're really focusing that on the workers' perspective side. Um, we felt that long term, what would help you as growers and owners would be to understand the risks at the business level for labor. Um, but we want to recognize the importance of all employees and how they feel that COVID impacts them and their risk of getting it at work, for example. So um, we went through a, a series of interviews. So, so I, I've done um, with the team, we've done maybe 20 some. I'd like to do quite a few more. So uh, we wanted to get a sense of a personal perspective, understand what kinds of things you need and what could we give you after two and a half months that actually might have value. I mean, maybe we don't wanna waste this money. We wanna give you something real that, that you can use afterwards. Um, so what we came up with is to give you through those interviews really that helped shape this. Um, so we're, as I said, there's going to be something specific for employers. So it's a self-assessment. It's going through your farm activities, rating what you do, how you do it, what level of automation you use, where your vulnerabilities are. And then at the end, pop down to the last bullet point, what you'll get back is some advice. So for every question that has, um, would you like more information on X, Y, or Z? We actually have built a whole database of inf searchable information that we can tap into and we can feed that back to you. We can give you information back on those specific questions that you said, I want more information on this and this. Okay, you'll get a PDF or some kind of uh, downloadable sheet that you can take back with you and that will have links to either suppliers or support people or service providers, et cetera, that would be relevant to those particular areas. So we hope that that's a valuable tool that we'll have ready at the end of March and we'll be able to have that up for you for at least two years, we'll make that available. And as I said, from the COVID perspective, we wanted to get that um, information and feedback from workers. So what is it that workers are feeling? What helps them feel more confident at work? Uh, what do they see how do they see the workplace through the eyes of covid and uh, so we have a survey that does not provide feedback the same way from that searchable database it will give some links to support mechanisms and information on public health uh, but it's really for them to give us an indication of what's happening uh, out there and in the workplace from their in their eyes and i think we will be able to take that information and give you the owners and managers and supervisors of those activities and those people, you'll gi we'll give you back um, some information to say, you know what, what we're seeing overall, these are anonymous, obviously the surveys uh, on the worker side, but um, we'll be able to, as a whole, be come back to you and say, we have information that suggests that maybe this type of meeting would really help or this kind of information or this kind of communication with your staff would make a huge difference in helping them feel more comfortable about being at work etc so we also want to look at you know what's the 
um, what are some of the things that they could suggest as a whole. We also want to make it available that they could print it out at the end anonymously and hopefully the employers will have a, a box, we we'll put a box out for them at the office or some kind of space where they can drop these in um, and they don't uh, aren't associated with a particular worker but then you can have responses from workers particular to your farm instead of just a big aggregated uh, response uh, from from all of the workers so we are going to be having that available for two years as well and we really encourage you to um, ask your workers to to look at that so we'll also have a webinar series and i think i actually have more uh slides that detail some of this uh further on so i'll keep uh moving slides a webinar series that i think we'll chat about in a second and also um i did mention a searchable database so let me just double check here um right so to advertise this we're going to have um yeah, I'll have more information in a minute. So to advertise this and make it available, we're going to create a, a single website that will host everything. So you'll be able to access a variety of things. So there'll be the links to those two assess the survey uh, for the workers and the self-assessment for the employer level. There's going to be a series of webinars that I'm going to talk about, and there'll also be um, access or links available to a searchable database. So you don't have to be uh, an employer or a worker or any label. You just have to be able to speak English and you can go in and search uh, all of the data that Anne and the team have collected together and create a, a, a specific search. So for example, if you go on Home Depot website uh, or, or maybe um, Canadian Tire and you can say I want to look for uh, screwdrivers and then you can go down and say okay I want different kinds of screwdrivers I want digital ones or I want whatever I want different automated ones I want motorized ones and you can select so that's the kind of concept that we're creating for a database of information so we'll have a link for that on the web page and the webinars are really critical that um, we wanted to bring experiences to you what we heard from all of you is that you all take different pieces of equipment, make them work for you. There's no one machine that works for every single farm. I don't think that's possible. You might all have a, a Java or an agronomics uh, potting machine, but you've all set them up differently and you have different attachments for them. And uh, so there's, and, and for somebody who has field growing, they don't want a potting machine. So how do you, how do you, how do we give you something fresh, something new, and tell you what's out there um, when we know that there's no answer specific uh, to one farm, maybe, but not for everyone? So that was a real challenge for us. So we said, okay, why don't we just give you a springboard, give you some webinars with some ideas, what people are doing. So for example, lean management, we're going to have a couple of companies from the States uh, that do consulting present some information about what it's all about, how they help, but then we'll bring some farms in and we'll say, you know, Van Bell, for example, uh, in BC, what have we done? How did we incorporate it? How did it work for us? So we've got um, that type of idea for these different presentations that will bring you some suggestions, some equipment, and hopefully some farms that have tried it out so they know what's happening, uh, you know, and you can think about that and say, could I use that? Well, that doesn't work that way, but maybe I could tweak it to do this. I think Dusty mentioned something of, on his talk about how he, you know, he was trying to use a great press and it didn't work for the blueberries. So, you know, he had to come up with a new way. So that's what we're doing. It's not, and the new way didn't even have anything to do with the great press, right? But it's that jump start of ideas. What happens if I see this and I look at things differently at my farm Would that work. So that's really what we're trying to do with the webinars. I think some of you went on the nursery tour, uh, I think maybe seven or so years ago to Germany and Holland and to Essen. And that was the idea, just an exploratory, what's out there? What can I adapt and change and think about for my farm? So we talked about the self-assessment in a bit detail earlier. Um, so online for a couple of years, it's going to be available in the end of March and it will be saveable. It will be something that gives you uh, advice at the back and gives you some feedback uh, responses based on what you've, you've asked about. 
And this is for the farms, for the uh, workers. So it's only for employees, but that we are going to need your help to share that. And again, um, that we will provide resources on COVID and public health at the end of it, back to the user. And I have a request actually. So if you're on your computers, take a screenshot or make a note. Could you please, please go back and see if you have a copy of these VHS tapes. So University of Guelph, Glenn Loomis was instrumental in putting these training books together, um, training courses together. And I would just love to view them. I can't uh, reproduce them, but if I could get some information from them, one of the pieces that we looked at was when farms uh, didn't have staff coming from Mexico or Jamaica, then they had to use local high school students or family members. Maybe they didn't always have the skill sets um, that they that they needed. So we wondered if we should review what kind of training materials are out there. CNLA has done an extensive written training package for the nursery sector, and then these were done. I'd like to look at these and see if there's anything that we can use or make a centralized database or source page for information for you so that you could send new staff to look at this YouTube video for two minutes before you start potting. At least you'll know what shoes to wear and where to you know, bring gloves and how to dress. Um, or maybe some more technical uh, skills that take a little bit longer and more in depth, uh, You know, whether it's grafting or whatever. So I think that's, uh, one of the requests that I have from you for today is if you can tech email me or text me, let me know if um, I could borrow them for a little while, that would be amazing. So if you haven't had an interview with me uh, already or with Anne, uh, please give us a call. Uh, let us know this week. We would love to do a few more. We still haven't reached all of you and I don't have email addresses for all of you or ways to reach you. So um, please reach out to me. It's the best way. And I'd like to I'd like to talk to people I don't normally chat with because uh, we learn a lot more. Uh, we encourage you when the employer assessment comes out to fill it out. Um, it will be savable. You will be able to do it again. Um, encourage some key staff to fill it out uh, as well as you. So if you have other managers, et cetera, that'd be great. Um, and for the workers, please encourage all your staff to do that. Box Tree Math, I'll just quickly run through my last few slides here. I just wanted to give you an update. I have been um, working on the clean plant side, um, developing a manual, a, mod uh, a module criteria document that's uh, with CFIA right now. CNCP has a module as well for managing box tree moth. Right now, just a special declaration on the phytosanitary certificate is accepted by APHIS. That's fine. Um, and uh, this is, I don't know if that's showing in the way. So if um, it's no different than last year in that sense, but we are working for a long-term program that um, theoretically that box tree moth, we expect it to spread. So if this affects more farms or we have to have a, a module in place that there's a potential for having that happen. And water, there's a lot of things happening actually. Um, we have uh, ministry is still doing inspections, believe it or not, and asking for pond overflow or uh, permits. Uh, and so there are some permit to take water changes coming as well. There's a workshop uh, next week at noon so let us know if you're interested in learning about that all of your uh, recordings will have to be done electronically and your new uh, applications for new permit to take water so that may not affect everyone but if you're doing a new or renewal permit to take water this year you should get involved and be part of that workshop uh, recently a new proposal went into place and they're changing the regulations and eventually water taking consumption numbers will become public that's very important I just want you to know that it's always been quite private your permit information has been public but not your actual consumption numbers so that's new uh, and uh, and will be coming into place in the next year and there's some other pieces that we are working on. Uh, as Jen mentioned, there's uh, the COHA project that's uh, the pond project. And um, there was a presentation uh, on 
January 26th, and that's on the Koha Connections website. Uh, so please feel free to go check that out. And there's a research meeting next week, uh, so we'll, on the 23rd. So that is all available. So you can catch up with me on, on what's happening on the Pond Project as well, but that's more private. That's not uh, as much of a Landscape Ontario uh, initiative. And again, invasive species, you know, uh, I have been off work basically for two years. I'm back and uh, I'm going back into sitting on the uh, Ontario Invasive Plant Council board and uh, being part of their meetings again. So I've been participating in some of their BMP development and making sure that it's the language is workable. It's not that these things don't have uh, invasive characteristics, but uh, how they word some of the text sometimes gets gets on my nerves. So. I'm definitely part of that for you. I'm <laughs> keeping an eye on it. So there's my contact information and uh, feel free to reach out anytime. I do work for you. So thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Janine. That was very informative. And so, yeah, as these meetings come up, um, just as a, an extra kind of advertising, I'll, I'll send them through that grower email distribution list that I have. And I know a bunch of you have emailed me already this morning saying, put me on the list. So uh, we'll get that information out also for the MECP meeting. So if I could just ask the speakers, Dusty and Janine, to just join me on video for a few minutes. We'll, uh, we'll open it up for question and answer for a few minutes. And just so everyone knows, you when this question and answer period is over in five minutes, that you can basically close out of here and then you're gonna have to go and find that link in your email from Amy for session room two and then log into that, put in your name and your email address again and then it's gonna look exactly the same as this except that it's gonna be me and some some other speakers. So I know it's confusing, but it was the way this, this platform was working today. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Yeah, and there's Janine's email. Uh, I know that there's a grower who sent us a photo of the videos, and uh, I'll let him know what address is. So you're gonna get you're gonna get some copies of those VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll I'm pay sure. for the shipping. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So I'll let him know. So thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. So are there any questions? that anybody has for any of the speakers this morning? I've got a comment there from Shared in Nurseries, um, <clears throat> which must be Mary Jane. So Mary Jane, uh, give me a text. And uh, she's looking to upload her presentation for the next session. You'll be able to play it from your computer yourself. You share your email. This is a fantastic resource. That was for, for Janine. And uh, that would be, that's really good feedback. Thank you. So maybe we'll be sending you an example. Uh, we, we would do want to have a small growers group that looks at the assessment over the next week or two. Um, so anybody that's out there, uh, Jason, <laughs> maybe you, um, but if there's others, we just like a small team to look at what we've created and make sure it's the kind of information you're looking for. We don't want to give you the address and information for Granger or, you know, Levitt safety. Like you already have that. Like you don't, it's like telling you to go to Home Depot. We, that's not what we want to do. We want to give you, um, innovative things, but also things that you may not have thought of that are out there. So please, uh, let us know if, if you're interested in getting a quick early peek to give us some feedback. And Dusty, I also wanna thank you for your presentation and for speaking to us today. It is, it's so valuable to see how other sectors are dealing with COVID and all the different innovative things you have to do. And I, I myself, when I'm listening, you know, whether it's on a tour or I'm watching a webinar, I'm listening to you and I'm listening to you about how, you, you know, it's like Janine said, you have to step outside yourself and look at things from a completely different perspective. Um, and uh, it, it's so valuable and it's, it's what I miss the most about tours and that we can't really do that right and who knows mm -hmm. in the future. But 
while you're talking about those things, my mind is working and, and it's working on another problem. So how can I look at this differently? And it's amazing how you can sort of come to some different ideas and solutions just by hearing about some of your experiences. So it is very valuable. Um, and with that, I don't really have any specific questions for either of you right now on the chat. Uh, oh, uh, there's a question, Dusty, do you have field production blueberries? Yes, uh, 100% of, uh, of all of our blueberries are, are in field. Um, 13 different varieties, uh, production starts about uh, July 2nd or 3rd um, and pushes to about the, the third week of August, if that, um, if that, unless or when that beautiful SWD bug shows its head. Um, and I'm sure we're all aware of, <laughs> of that one. Um, so yeah, we, we do have some late varieties, uh, specifically Elliot's that we've been testing for quite a few years. Um, but just the way that our, the, the season is made up, um, and how then we get into plant harvest, uh, pretty much all of our labor goes into, uh, it goes into the nursery. Um, 85% goes through, um, goes through national grocers and the remaining goes to the food terminal to uh, ethnic grocery stores. Um, pH of blueberry. So uh, there was a question. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So the pH uh, for blueberries, we do put down, um, uh, we, 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 we delayed for quite some time, um, but we did put down some fresh cedar. Um, uh, what? Yeah, so what we're like aiming for for pH uh, is like 4.5, somewhere in there. Um, so, and we just put down some fresh cedar, and that should last us for 10, 15, uh, 10, 15 years. Um, and it's uh, some of our oldest, some of our oldest got treated a lot differently than our newest plantings uh, in terms of creating the, the V bed uh, for the material that you put down, uh, but can't stress enough. Um, how important it is to create that initial bed for the initial takeoff uh, and it pays dividends uh, for the nurse or for your crop um, years after. Do you see yourself doing more alcohol sanitizer production in the future, Dusty? Would you collaborate to get more, more fruit from other growers? Uh, to collaborate with other bear growers to use lower grade fruit for alcohol production. Um, Yes and no. Um, the the fruit the fruit beer category is something that uh, like like right now uh, all of our coconut for our the coconut county comes from uh, classic coconut in Simcoe. Um, so we're we're using we're using those products uh, over. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're always experimenting. Like the orange, actually we have a lime. Uh, we, we get the limes and we actually zest, like our brewer zests 400 limes for our lime pilsner. Um, so yeah, we're always screwing around. The problem with fruit, honestly, is getting into a stable state. Um, uh, because unless it's a beer that we're doing pretty much specifically either with a certain account or for our outdoor tap room, um, the, the sugars just aren't stable enough. For us, uh, we just don't want secondary fermentation because that leads to fireworks. Uh, so we just worry about that. But yeah, it's something that we're always open for. Okay, great. All right, with that, thank you very much. I'm gonna close the session so I can jump on to the next one. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Janine, maybe you'll be attending for the rest. So check your session room two link that Amy sent you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.